Are your utility bills driving you into debt? Is your mom kicking you out of the basement because your server consumes more than all Chinese mining farms combined? Is Radiation Safety Committee knocking at your door because your home server looks like a juicy piece of enriched plutonium from space? Well, fret not, because in this video I'll show you how to build a super power efficient home server slash NAS, no matter your use case. Whether you need a low power mini PC or a beefy Proxmox host, I'm gonna tell you how to get the best performance per watt and make sure your home lab hobby doesn't stick out like a sore thumb on your power power bills. So strap in and let's get started. This is my current home server. I primarily use it for video editing over the 10 gig connection and media storage. It draws around 23 watts from the wall on average and with current energy prices in Germany this machine costs me around 5 euros and 37 cents per month to run 24 7. Now considering the fact that a lot of r slash home lab users run machines that draw 120 plus watts at idle, I think 23 watts is pretty good. Keep in mind that this is not an Intel NUC or a similar small form factor computer, I'm running a full blown rack mount server with 4 3.5 inch hard drives, 2 NVMe drives and a 10 gigabit networking card. So why would you even spend time optimizing the power consumption of your server in the first place? Well, if you live in a country with expensive electricity, the difference between running a 50 watt home server and running a 100 watt home server will definitely be noticeable on your energy bill. And considering the looming energy crisis in Europe, this might become very relevant for a lot of people very soon. A power efficient server will also stay cool and quiet, so if you live in a country with hot climate or just don't like fan noise, this might be the way to go. Whatever your personal reason is, designing your home server to be as power efficient as possible is a great way to save some money and I don't know, personally, I just kind of like the idea of squeezing the most out of my system while making it consume as little juice as possible. Some people might find my power efficiency obsession stupid and pointless, especially if you live in a country with cheap electricity and, you know, just don't care about your utility bill. Well, good news, I don't force you to become a power saving freak like me and you're free to ignore my advice or skip this video altogether. But if at least one person finds the information in this video helpful, that means my work hasn't been done in vain. Building a power efficient server begins with, well, picking power efficient components. And that's not as simple as buying a low TDP CPU and pairing it with a server motherboard. First things first, if you want to save on your utility bill, don't buy old hardware. By old, I mean pretty much anything older than Haswell or the fourth generation of Intel CPUs. Older systems might be cheaper, but your savings will probably go towards paying the increased utility bill. Even though older CPUs might have the same nominal TDP as the newer ones, they're much less efficient at idle and might not support all the latest power efficient C states that the newer CPUs support. At the same time, newer doesn't necessarily mean more power efficient, and recently we've seen the PC components like CPUs and graphics cards become more and more power hungry for the sake of performance. Pretty much any Intel CPU that is 6th gen or newer will be pretty power efficient at idle. And even though the newer CPUs might be slightly more efficient, you will have to shell out more money for a newer motherboard and of course a more expensive CPU. So if you're okay with the performance of something like 6th or 7th gen CPUs, don't chase the newer 12th or 13th gen CPUs purely because of the power efficiency. But what about AMD? Well, when it comes to Intel versus AMD, Intel systems tend to win when it comes to budget-ish systems, since they tend to consume less than equivalent AMD Ryzen machines. Ryzen CPUs also still seem to suffer from the idle freeze bug on Linux, which can only be fixed reliably by disabling the power efficiency states in the BIOS, which is kind of counterintuitive. That being said, you can still build a pretty power efficient system with a Ryzen CPU, and some users report as little as 7 watt power consumption with a 4350G. One more thing that I want to mention is that the TDP spec means absolutely nothing for the real world power consumption in a home server. TDP only describes the power consumption under load. And in a lot of cases, even that figure doesn't match what you would see in the real world. Despite consuming upwards of 100 watts under load, many modern processors can still enter a power efficient idle state in which they sip less than 1 watt. That also applies to the T-series Intel CPUs. These are pretty much the same chips as the non-T models, just capped to a smaller TDP. This has no effect on the idle power consumption, so don't pay more money for a T-series CPU because of supposed power savings. 
Since your server will most likely be idling most of the time, at least compared to a desktop PC, the idle draw is exactly the figure that we're interested in, and it can vary wildly depending on your motherboard, PCIe devices, power supply, and so on. Unfortunately, very few manufacturers and reviewers publish the idle power consumption figures, but luckily for us, there's a whole community focused on building power efficient systems, and it can be found on this German forum called Hardware Lux. The forum members even maintain a database of the most power efficient builds sorted by consumption, which can be a great help if you're looking for power efficient components. So let's dive in. As you can see, the most power efficient systems, the ones that consume as little as 1 to 4 watts, are Intel NUX, laptop motherboards, and basically ultra small form factor PCs. Obviously, those computers are power efficient for a reason. They don't have the most beefy CPUs in them, and the number of feature and ports is also very limited. You'll rarely find more than one SATA or NVMe slot, and PCIe is also usually out of the question. That's the price we have to pay for the ultimate power efficiency, and if you're okay with not having those features, then these options could be for you. These machines should still have plenty of power for virtualization, Docker, Kubernetes, Proxmox, or even running a media server or a home assistant instance but they're probably not the best choice for NAS since they lack expansion. If you want your home server to be a bit more capable, the next option is a desktop CPU and a MiniTX motherboard. MiniTX motherboards tend to have less ports and features than their ATX counterparts, but because of that, they usually consume less power. You might think that the difference between a MiniTX motherboard and a full ATX mobile with the same CPU is negligible, and you'll be wrong. Most modern CPUs are pretty efficient at idle no matter the motherboard, contributing as little as 1 watt to the overall power consumption. However, if a motherboard isn't really optimized for power efficiency or has a bunch of onboard devices like multiple NICs, audio serial, IKVM modules, and so on, those devices can add as much as 10 to 15 watt to your overall power draw, and disabling them in BIOS doesn't always help. However, not all MiniTX motherboards are made equal, and some models are just not that very well optimized for power efficiency. These MiniTX motherboards from Aswork and Fujitsu, on the other hand, seem to be especially good when it comes to power efficiency. So if you're okay with only having one PCIe slot, a MiniTX motherboard is definitely an option that you should consider. Some server and workstation motherboards also support PCIe bifurcation, which lets you connect multiple devices to one PCIe slot using a bifurcated riser like this one. However, a bifurcated riser can cost you as much or even more than the motherboard itself, so it's only really worth it if you're trying to build a small form factor server in the first place. But what if you need multiple PCIe slots? I have a 10 gigabit card and an NVMe adapter that I need to plug into my motherboard, and the Azure mobile that I used before only had one PCIe slot and no NVMe. Well, let's once again take a look at the spreadsheet. As you might be able to tell, the most power efficient motherboards, aside from MiniTX and ultra small form factor PCs, are from Fujitsu. This build in particular is very impressive. An Intel Core i7-9700K and a Fujitsu D3643H combo only puts 5.8 watts from the wall. I already had a CPU handy, so I started looking into Skylake motherboards from Fujitsu, and I found this D3402 motherboard on eBay. With 5 SATA slots and 2 full-size PCIe X16 slots, it fit my needs perfectly. Now, if you don't have any parts handy and want to build a new PC from scratch, I would recommend going for a newer Fujitsu motherboard that supports at least Intel 8th gen CPUs. Or at least I would if you could actually buy them. At the moment, both 8th and 9th gen Fujitsu motherboards are out of stock on pretty much all online marketplaces, new and used. But when they do crop up, they're usually not super expensive, so keep your eyes peeled. Meanwhile, you can take a look at the 6th and 7th gen motherboards. They seem to be easier to find on eBay and local marketplaces, and they're also very power efficient. After rebuilding my system and replacing the MiniTX Astro motherboard with the Fujitsu one, I booted the machine up, waited for the drive to spin down, and looked at the power consumption. It pretty much stayed the same, which was kind of disappointing, but at the same time it did not increase, despite me switching to a bigger motherboard. On the other hand, similar builds in the spreadsheet pull less than 10 watts, so how is it that my system still pulls 20? Well, let me introduce you to package C states. Package C states are power efficient semi idle states that the system can go into when there isn't much going on. The system is still technically awake in this state and can do background tasks but consumes much less power. 
There are usually 8 to 10 package C states on modern systems, and the bigger the number, the bigger the power savings. C1 corresponds to high system activity, whereas C8 is kind of like a daydream. The easiest way to see which C state your system is in is by using a command line utility called PowerTop. You can install it by using your favorite package manager, and after doing that, let's open it and go to the idle states tab. Keep in mind that we're looking at package C states on the left, and not the CPU C states. As you can see, my system only goes down to C3, which is not ideal. What could be the reason? Well, either the OS and the software configuration, or pretty much any connected device that might just have crappy firmware. The former is very easy to verify by booting up a fresh Ubuntu Live USB, installing PowerTop, executing PowerTop Autotune, and then running PowerTop again, and taking a look at the measurements. If it stays the same, the issue is probably with the hardware. In my case, the culprit was my 10 gig networking card, Mellanox Connect X3. It's pretty old and I bought it for cheap, and because of its age, it doesn't really support proper PCIe power management. As a result, with the card installed, the system wouldn't go into deep idle. Unfortunately, the cheapest SFU Plus card that supports ASPM is Mellanox Connect X4, which starts at 170 euros on the used market. Not really worth the investment. Another common culprit are cheap NVMe drives. The companies making budget drives don't usually put a lot of money in firmware and power optimizations, so with a lot of them, you won't get proper ASPM support, once again resulting in no deep idle. I got two cheap SSDs, one from Sabrans and one from Crucial, and the former does not support ASPM and won't let my system go lower than C3. As you can see with the Mellanox card and the SSD disconnected, the system now goes as low as C8, which results in 8 watt idle, even with 4 WD Red Pros connected to it in the standby mode. Obviously, at this point, it's not really worth it because I would like to keep my 10 gig networking and my SSD. So, what are some other options for reducing power consumption? Well, the thing is, even with all the right hardware and a platform that can go down to C8 idle, you probably won't see the power consumption go as low as 8 watts with a conventional ATX power supply. And that's because even power suppliers with gold and platinum rating have relatively poor efficiency at lower loads. Which is understandable, if you're building a conventional desktop PC, you probably aren't planning to just let it sit at idle and do nothing for the whole day. If you turn it on, it's probably to do some gaming, or watch YouTube videos, or do some work, or something else. Because of that, a lot of people who run low power systems use alternative power supplies called Pico PCUs, paired with laptop power bricks. Nani? Those PCUs are much more efficient at lower loads, and as an added bonus, they're also completely fanless. Thanks to their size, they also work really well in small form factor systems. Obviously, using a Pico PCU only makes sense if your idle power is lower than 50 watts and doesn't peak higher than 200 watts. Otherwise, the savings will be negligible. Another downside of the Pico PCU is the number of power connectors. You will usually have a CPU connector, the 4-pin one, the 24-pin ATX connector, one Molex and one SATA connector. And that's it. However, you can use splitters to connect more devices, and I'm currently using a Molex Y splitter for the SATA backplane on my Supermicro case. It has 4 WD Pro 7200 RPM hard drives installed in it, and the whole system pulls as much as 120 watts while booting up, which is still well within the 160 watt spec of my particular model. For systems with more than 4 hard drives or a dedicated GPU, I suggest this 550 watt Corsair PCU instead. The 2021 model in particular has shown to be almost as power efficient at low loads as a Pico PCU, and with way more power connectors is basically the best of both worlds. If you're building a NAS, you're obviously gonna need hard drives. And here you have a choice between 5400 RPM and 7200 RPM drives. The 7200 RPM drives are usually slightly faster than the 5400 ones, but also run louder and hotter and consume more power. Western Digital, who by the way sponsored this video, has both 5400 RPM and 7200 RPM TMR drives in their red lineup, WD Red Plus and WD Red Pro. The WD Red Plus drives consume as little as 3 watt in idle, and when spinned down, this number goes down to 0.4 watts. And the 7200 RPM Red Pro drives, apart from being faster, can also be used in server enclosures with up to 24 hard drive bays, thanks to their anti-vibration technology. 
both Western Digital Red Plus and Pro are CMR drives, no matter what capacity you go for, and they are a great choice for a RAID or a ZFS array. Thanks again Western Digital for sponsoring this video, and now let's go back to the topic of power efficiency. If you're trying to build a power efficient, cool and quiet server, I would definitely recommend going with 5400 RPM drives. You probably won't notice the speed difference compared to 7200 RPM drives unless you run a RAID or ZFS array with dozens of drives. But what you will notice is slower spin-up times, higher temperatures and higher power consumption. So unless you absolutely know that you need 7200 RPM drives, just go with 5400 RPM. However, even 5400 RPM drives will still consume power while spinning. It's not much, a single hard drive will draw around 3 to 8 watts, but it obviously scales with the number of hard drives that you have in your system. So no matter how well optimized the rest of your build is, if you have let's say 6 to 8 hard drives spinning all the time, you will see a sharp increase in your power consumption and noise. Now my personal solution to this is to spin down the drives after a certain period of inactivity. However, spin down is kind of a controversial topic. Some people say that spinning your drives up and down causes additional wear and tear, and can possibly reduce your drive's lifespan. But some people argue that this is not an issue anymore with newer hard drives. Smin Lel on Tom's Hardware Forums says, This is not as big a problem as it once was. In the old days, when you spun down a drive, the heads would lose the air cushion and come to rest on the platter as it was slowing down. That caused wear. Most modern drives use loading ramps, which let the heads be retracted beyond the edge of the disc so that there's no physical contact between them and the platters when the drive is spun down. As a result of this, the drive specs that I've seen show ratings of the order of 300,000 stop-start cycles. That's a 10-year lifespan if the drives are stopped and started every 20 minutes during every hour of every day, 365 days a year. Spinning down a drive brings its power consumption from 3 to 8 watts down to less than half a watt. It also completely eliminates noise and provided you don't spin your drives up and down every 5 minutes, shouldn't have any appreciable impact on your drive's lifespan. I found that spinning the drives down after 30 minutes of inactivity works pretty well for my case. However, spinning down the drives also means that they'll have to spin back up before you can access the data stored on them. This might not be a big deal with 5400 RPM drives, but 7200 RPM drives take longer to spin up, and if you're running something like Unraid or MergerFS, the drives will spin up sequentially instead of all at the same time, which will result in a longer wait before you can access the data stored on those drives. But there is a way you can eat your cake and have it too, that is to say, have near immediate access to frequently used data and minimize the hard drive power draw and noise. Now normally, if you want to have a fast NAS with instant access times, you have to either create a RAID array with dozens of drives and keep them all powered on all the time, or build an SSD only NAS with no spinning rust whatsoever. The former requires a beefy server motherboard and multiple HBA cards, and will also have a massive impact on your power consumption. And the latter will obviously cost an arm and a leg, since SSDs are much more expensive when it comes to raw dollar per gigabyte value. However, by adding a relatively small SSD array to your NAS, you can make use of a technique called tiered caching. Tiered caching is the process of combining fast and slow drives into one array to speed up the file operations. You basically tell all applications and services to write to the SSD array first, and once it gets filled up or you haven't accessed the data in a while, the files get moved to the slow drives. Unraid, one of the popular NAS operating systems, actually includes a utility called Mover that does exactly that. You can set any of your shares to use the cache, and then the Mover will take care of moving the files from the cache array to the slow spinning disk array regularly. If you're not using Unraid, there's also a Python script written by a GitHub user Elmas that basically accomplishes the same thing. You can schedule it with cron and customize some parameters to fit your workflow, such as the target percentage of drive space and so on. The SSD array that you'll use for caching can be as small or as big as you can afford, but in this situation, bigger is better. If you attempt to write a file that is bigger than the whole SSD in one go, you'll probably encounter an input-output error. Apart from that, the bigger your array is, the less you'll have to spin up your hard drives, which means more power savings and longer drive lifespan. For my NAS, I currently use a RAID 0 array of two 1TB consumer-grade NVMe SSDs, and it has been plenty for my use case. I'm planning to upgrade it to an array of four 2TB WD Red SSDs soon though, 
So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that video. So that's basically all the tech tips that I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video and as usual, I would like to thank my patrons. James Uppington, Mitchell Valentino, Carlos Banilla, David Love, Catherine DC, Primus, Remus Ilyesh, Robot Stream of Crypto, and everybody else supports this channel. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.